think again about the structure of DNA and how it might carry instructions. A single chain that simply repeats one symbol would carry no useful information. But a chain made up of different symbols can encode information. Information needs difference. In fact, life's genetic instructions are spelled out in combinations of the letters A, G, C and T, the four bases of the DNA molecule. In effect, one particular sequence of bases containing one particular piece of information is one gene. Genes code for proteins. Each specific gene codes for a specific polypeptide within a protein. Now proteins are extremely important in living organisms. Some proteins are structural. Others, for example, are enzymes. A typical gene is about a thousand base pairs or so. Now that may seem rather a lot, but there's plenty to spare in DNA. You see, this model actually represents a very, very small section of a real DNA molecule. Real DNA molecules would be many, many times longer than this. They're the largest molecules known by far. In fact, a single human DNA molecule on this sort of scale would be thousands and thousands of miles long. And if you consider the 23 different molecules of DNA in a human haploid cell, and add all the base pairs together, you come out with a figure around about 3 billion, that's 3,000 million, base pairs. Now, frankly, numbers like that don't mean very much to me. So how can we put numbers of that sort into some sort of perspective? Take a telephone directory, and imagine the whole thing is composed of a very tiny print, and that each letter and each digit corresponds to a base pair. Well, to get three billion, you'd need a couple of hundred or so different directories. Now, in any particular type of cell, not all the genes in the DNA are being used. Essentially, some genes are switched on and some are switched off. Well, what does that imply? Imagine you've got an instruction manual and you want to use just some instructions at a particular time in a particular place without lugging the whole manual around. Now, how could you do that? Well, one way is to choose the instruction you need, tear it out, use them, discard them. But if this is DNA, the cell can't do things that way because the DNA will be damaged. And sooner or later, all of the DNA has to be copied and the copies passed on to future generations of cells. So that can't be the way things happen. OK, back to a manual. Another way of doing things is not to tear things out, but to make a photocopy of just the instructions you need at the particular time. And in a sense, that's what happens in living cells. The genes that are switched on, those that are going to be used, are copied. That is, the information in them is copied to make a copy called messenger RNA. To make a particular protein in the cell, the relevant gene is first switched on in the DNA. A working copy of the gene, called messenger RNA, is made. This copying process is called transcription. Next, the information in the messenger RNA is acted upon to produce a protein. This step is called translation, since it involves translating the four-letter code in DNA or RNA into the sequence of amino acids in a protein. Let's look at these steps in more detail. But first, a look at RNA. To understand how a working copy of the gene is made, we need to be familiar with the structure of RNA. Unlike DNA, RNA is just a single strand of nucleotide units. In DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. In RNA, 
it's ribose. As for the bases, although three are identical, adenine, guanine, and cytosine, the thymine in DNA is replaced by uracil in RNA. Uracil is very similar to thymine. It always pairs with adenine. That is, it obeys the same base pairing rules. OK, so specific base pairing has cropped up again. You've already seen how important it is in the structure of DNA and in the replication of DNA. And now you'll see how vital it is in the production of messenger RNA in a process known as transcription. When transcription starts, a small section of DNA is unwound. One of the two unwound strands acts as a template for making the message. The messenger RNA is built up, one nucleotide at a time, according to the familiar base pairing rules. A on the DNA pairs with U on the RNA, G pairs with C, T pairs with A, and so on. The result? A message with a base sequence complementary to the template strand of the DNA. This messenger RNA will eventually be used to direct the formation of a protein. You might have been wondering how the cell uses linear information, the basis in messenger RNA, to produce something obviously three-dimensional, a protein. Well, in fact, the problem isn't quite as complicated as it might seem. You see, in every protein, there are one or more polypeptide chains, linear structures, that run throughout the three-dimensional structure of the protein. Now what this means can be seen more easily on a simpler model. This is a large-scale model of a polypeptide. It's all twisted up here, but in fact, in essence, it's a linear structure. Now, this represents a fairly short polypeptide. Real polypeptides would generally have many more units than this. And each unit is an amino acid, here represented by a ball. Each ball is an amino acid. Now, in polypeptides, you have 20 different types of amino acid. So the problem reduces to this. How does the cell use linear information in messenger RNA, which has four types of unit, the four different bases, to produce this, a linear polypeptide with 20 different types of unit, with 20 different amino acids. It turns out that each triplet of bases on the messenger RNA, called a codon, corresponds to a particular amino acid. Now there has to be a chemical connection between each triplet codon and each amino acid. A special adapter molecule called transfer RNA makes that connection. One end of the adapter carries a particular triplet of bases called an anticodon. This matches up with a specific triplet codon on the messenger RNA. The other end of the transfer RNA is capable of binding to the unique amino acid corresponding to that anticodon. Since there are 20 amino acids, there must be at least 20 different transfer RNA adapters. So, for a protein chain to be assembled, each triplet codon on the message is read. The transfer RNA adapter with the relevant anticodon binds the messenger. The amino acids at the other end of the transfer RNA adapters become joined by a peptide bond. Once a transfer RNA molecule is no longer needed, it's released. The process repeats, elongating the peptide chain until a stop codon is reached. <laughs>